I want to begin by saying my name is CJ Armstrong. All right. I took off my name tag uh, for the lav mic. Uh, if you're interested in chatting with me further about anything, hey, I'm happy to do so. My email is clinton.armstrong at cui. Dot edu because I'm a professor at Concordia University in Irvine, Southern California. That's where uh, Aubrey went to school. That's how I know her. She was my student for at least, oh gosh, a lot of classes, right? We, four years, well, yeah, well, it's too many if you take them over and over again. And uh, <laughs> one, of my, one of my fine students who's now teaching classical school in Plano, Texas, uh, that's the cy.edu. The Clinton part is my first name, but the only people who ever call me Clinton are my mother and telemarketers. That's how I know the, who's on the phone. It's either my mother or somebody trying to sell me something or my mother trying to sell me something, right? <laughs> She's disappointed that I, I call myself CJ, but this has been going on since kindergarten. She said, I named you Clint. It's like, well, that's uh, not my name, Mom. So uh, I teach Latin, I teach Greek, I teach uh, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, ancient history, mythology. Uh, I'm doing uh, Gospel of John this uh, year, as well as some CMC Greek for our uh, cross cultural ministry students, as well as core history, which goes from 3000 BC to uh, Renaissance Reformation. And besides that, uh, guided readings. I'm doing Hildegard of Bingen with a graduate student right now. And anything that the university tells me to teach, I basically do. I've done Japanese and Chinese history. I've done all kinds of stuff. Um, but my favorite stuff to do is language. I just dig Latin and Greek. And I want to be able to raise students up to be able to read with me when they come to uh, college and uh, when they, uh, or, or get them in college and, and teach them so that they're able to read with me junior and senior year, uh, their, their third and fourth years at university, so that we can uh, uh, enjoy the best literature that's out there, which is what I call classical literature. I'm going to introduce myself as a classicist. My uh, PhD work was on uh, one particular text. It was the Metamorphoses of Publius Ovidius Nasso, 43 BC to 18 AD, greatest poet ever to live. Man, he's good. And uh, uh, the 15 book epic that he wrote, the Metamorphoses, great piece of literature. And you can read it in translation uh, as we uh, read most Latin and Greek and other ancient literature in translation. But what a joy then to be able to have the chops, to have the skills, to have uh, a, a little bit Bit and then a little bit more and sufficient enough to be able to get into an ancient text so that you're not dealing with somebody else's interpretation so that you can read uh, without that uh, intermediary. And that's ultimately what classics enjoys doing with literature, with song, poetry. Uh, area studies classics is uh, history. It is numismatics. That is study of like ancient coins, other artifacts, uh, looking at architecture, looking at sociology, looking at burial practices and uh, ancient science and, and all kinds of things. It's one of the greatest area studies degrees. Uh, I got into my um, uh, uh, time in thinking about classical education primarily because of classics, but classics is not the same as classical education. Uh, and a lot of people who think about classical ed think, okay, well, that, uh, uh, what you study in classical education, that's all of what we mean by classics. But my, speci my specific uh, uh, discipline deals with the ancient Mediterranean, really. Anything that is of its time from, uh, say, 3000 BC, although we don't know a lot about the Bronze Age, right, up to the, the end of the Greek period, uh, with the, the advent of the Macedonians, Alexander the Great, the Hellenistic period, uh, and then the advent of the Romans from the 8th century uh, to the 5th century AD. So that 3,500 years of history is what classics is all about, and it's accessible only if you know the languages. If you got Greek, if you got Latin, those are the essential things. And that's why mm, I, I specialize in the teaching of those languages. We're here today to talk about uh, Latin. I was asked to give a talk on how to teach Latin. And I don't know if I can do that. But what I'd like to begin with is asking you uh, whether that's your expectation or whether you have other questions. And to do that, what I'd like to ask you first is how many homeschoolers are here? 
two, three, four, good, good. Um, or, or you want to be later on, okay? Uh, how many classical teachers are there? So you're a faculty at a classical school, right? Okay, so kind of here, and yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and you, I know, yeah. Uh, do you, uh, for that subset, are you teaching language? Are, are you a Latin teacher? You're smiling like, hey, maybe I got in this for volleyball, but they're telling me I got to teach Latin. Okay, yeah, I understand. Um, uh, any independent scholars here just for fun? No, none of those. All right, um, a parochial or private school that is church related or non-church related and not necessarily classical. I knew I'd have one of those. You're not in a classical school, but you're in a private school. Oh, good, good. blessed art thou, good luck, right? I hope it happens in a, new, in a year, right? Or 10, right? Yeah, but it, it will happen, this is good. Which one is it? Um, Heartland, Michigan, our saviors. Wonderful, wonderful, yes sir. I teach uh, New Testament Greek and classical Latin for CCLE, I yeah. all the classes online. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And is, you got adults and little kids? Just adults. Just adults. You don't like little kids? South of the CCLE. All right. Yeah. Free marketing. You like adults, though. You like W.C. Fields. He didn't like children or dogs. All right. Well, they, they tell me I'm just teaching adults. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Like. Yeah, good. Good. Uh, last category. Just a... a a pastor or a professor and uh, like at the secondary or post-secondary or you're doing stuff for your church or Sunday morning or something like that okay um, yeah kind of you teach your uh, your pastor you teach your parishioners Latin oh okay and then we oh fantastic you got like all kinds of Venn diagram overlap with that you get, yeah good good now how many of you, and this is my last question before I ask another one, how many of you know Latin? You're kind of, sort of, you know it, okay. You, you kind of, sort of know it. That's great when you raise your hand, but your teacher doesn't. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and you know it? Well, as much as she may. Hey, fantastic. It's my weaker of the two classic languages, but... You, yeah. Your Greek is good, and your Latin is... Eh. History Greek, double major. Okay, where at? Hillsdale College. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, if, you, if you do what uh, you are told to do at Hillsdale from freshman year on, you'll just get a classics minor whether you like it or not, all right? That's great. Great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, but nobody really does Greek that, right? Is my stronger. I've done PhD studies in Testament. Yeah. And uh, I had Latin in high school and in college and a couple years. I'm, I'm a few chapters ahead of my students. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. I feel the same thing about Hildegard right now, uh, and that's that, that's important. If if they have a, a teacher that's able to teach, God bless you. Continue to do so. Be warm and well fed. When I got to the seminary, I was I went to St. Louis, graduated in '01, and uh, I went to Washington University because they have a classics program there as well. And uh, they were shocked at me because my Latin has always been stronger than my Greek. That's easier. Why would I take Greek? It's uh, got foreign alphabets and stuff like that. I, I always emphasize Latin, and it's always been my first love. Although uh, you got to know both for sure. So I'm, I, I would say I'm equal at both. But uh, we're here to talk about Latin, and from what I saw, I got a couple of shakes, a couple of well, I'm not not quite sure. And uh, I wish I could give you something in 40 minutes that says, boom, now I know Latin, but I can't do that. Sorry. Um, so how do you how do you do this? Um, I'm gonna I, I've got prepared things to say that may or may not be helpful, but, but I don't want to self-aggrandize. I don't want you to tell to tell you just a whole lot about my biography. But I do have some things that I have found inspiring that I'll I'll, I'll help you out with. Uh, but in order to be most fruitful for you, uh, what I'd like to ask you first, especially for those who are kind of shaky or say, hey, I've never done this before, and you have specific questions about it, I'd like to know how you think um, a, C a CCLE talk like this, uh, even in a, a Q&A or workshopping this, could help you better prepare, or specific advice, or, hey, I'm having trouble doing X, Y, or Z. I'd really like to know that so that I know my audience a little bit better, because we have some time to do that, okay? So please uh, tell me specifically, what questions do you have? And before that, what time do I have to stop? Do you remember? Is it on your thing? Uh, like 4.20, I think. 4.20? Okay. Okay. 
Oh yeah, till the banquet, <laughs> till the banquet. The banquet, which unfortunately I have to skip this year because my wife gave me a present. I, she's taking me to a book signing at the Barnes and Noble in downtown. It's Getty Lee of Rush. Anybody know Rush? The Canadian power trio? Yes. So I get to meet Getty Lee tonight. Unfortunately, I had to make a choice. See, see, like Getty Lee. Okay, I'm going to get it. Yes. Okay, so you've got a question. What's your name? Uh, Natalie. And where are you from? I'm a homeschooler. Mm -hmm. I taught Latin at our Savior One, last year, but wonderful. now I'm back in Minnesota. So. Okay. But, but, um, anyway, yeah. um, the, I learned when I was in high school and college, I learned classical. Mm -hmm. And then when I started teaching in a classical school that wasn't Lutheran, mm -hmm. They insisted that I teach ecclesiastical, uh -huh. and I realized how much that messed up my Latin. pronunciation. <laughs> pronunciation. Yeah. Um, but is I mean, I would tend toward the toward the classical. Okay. But I, I think you know sometimes we think oh because it's a Christian school we got to do ecclesiastical. And, you know, I know. I big long debate. I think it's cute. Can you just summarize very briefly? Um, why I'm right that classical is better. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, the, uh, where we're going for this goal is number one, the major goal, be consistent. Whatever you do, choose what you're going to do and do that for the next 25 years and don't change it because your kids will get confused and your faculty will get confused and wh whatever it happens to be. It was a different loop. It was a different class. And that's fine. This one, this one there. And when I'm uh, personally doing Latin, if I'm, if I'm looking at Neo-Latin, I'm going to um, read it with a more uh, Italian flair. And when I'm reading Cicero, I'm going to be reading Cicero. All right, I'm doing it with a classical pronunciation. When I teach uh, at university or anybody, if I have my druthers, I teach classical Latin. But what's classical Latin? Is that the oldest stuff we have? I'm not teaching them Oscan. I'm not teaching them any of the other Italian dialects that were prevalent from the 8th century all the way up to the, the time of Augustus. Uh, there, there were other dialects of Latin besides what we teach as uh, classical Latin. But just for the sake of consistency, a C should make a K sound. Hmm? A V should make a W sound. The U and the V, same uh, letter, and uh, let's not uh, freak out about how things are spelled necessarily. But it's a little deeper than that, right? Than just pronunciation? That's where I find the bulk of this uh, of argument is how you're going to do it, which is why I make this the, the question of be consistent. However you're teaching Latin, make sure that you are consistent. Uh, and it's not just the C's or K's, it's the T, T before I, it's not at C on us, it's at T on us, or that, that sort of thing. Um, but what else comes with an ecclesiastical uh, a curriculum? If you're going to be working with ecclesiastical Latin, you're going to be dealing with an, a, a great deal of vocabulary that is specific to the Bible, to uh, doctrinal statements, and sometimes to uh, uh, medieval Christianity. And these are good and salutary things to learn, but it might not help you with Cicero. So vocabulary is one uh, 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 leg of the tripod that is important for any language learning. And so you want to be able to pick a curriculum that attacks vocabulary for the purposes that your entire curriculum is set. Do you have a school that says what we want to do is offer them the fonts, the uh, sources of classical learning from the ancient Mediterranean and want to give students at some level, once they've gotten enough education, the ability to enter into the language and literature of the age, then you want to uh, choose curriculum, uh, choose books that offer as much vocabulary as possible and as comprehensive a syntax as possible and as clear uh, an explanation of morphology as possible. If I'm building the tripod, I'll try to continue on with what? Syntax? And then the final leg of that would be morphology. And if you've got this, you've got a language curriculum. Those are the three things that you're emphasizing. If you're doing Italian or Latvian or Greek or English <laughs> or Latin.
All right. So your ecclesiastical Latin, um, uh, it, it may be good if you're teaching at the Dominican Academy, and that classical school requires you probably not to read as much Lucretius as it does Thomas Aquinas. Right? So make certain that you get the vocabulary for Thomas Aquinas. But if you're going classics as classical school, if you're going uh, ancient Greek and or uh, ancient Greek history and ancient Latin literature, then choose a, uh, a not not so parochial, right? Or um, uh, uh, limited vocabulary. Uh, choose one that would be, hey, we're going to get into ancient Rome. This is good. Uh, one quick uh, story on that. I'm teaching this term uh, in Greek uh, from Mounce's Basics of Biblical Greek, which has a, a total vocabulary of 300 words, the 300 most frequently occurring words in the Greek New Testament, which gets you basically uh, to be able to recognize eight out of every 10 words in the Greek New Testament uh, in some form or other. I think that's fantastic. It's not what I teach my undergrads. I teach my undergrads uh, something that is at least five to six times as much vocabulary over the course of 16 weeks and a great deal more grammar as well because I want them to be able to read Plato. Turns out that if you can read Plato, you can read John. If you can read John, you can't necessarily read Plato. Which one would you rather have? Which one is easier? <laughs> Uh, John. <laughs> but that doesn't make Plato difficult. It just means that you have to discipline yourself to memorize some more stuff. That's all. So as an educator, I think the move should always go. Um, you have to get more comprehensive and then you know, limit yourself to your New Testament reading or your, your ecclesiastical Latin uh, stuff. Because if you can read Cicero, you can read Thomas Aquinas. And Isaac Newton in the original Latin. It's not hard. Yeah. Good question. Does that satisfy your, your question? What's your name? Jocelyn. Jocelyn, where are you from? I'm from South Bend, Indiana. Wonderful, wonderful. And I'm doing this conference. Oh, and good. I am um, homeschooling uh, five children ages 2 to 11 yeah. right now. So, of course, what I want to know about every subject. Sorry. How do I hit them all without doing five separate Latin lessons. Oh, baby, that's hard. You're not doing like five independent studies, five correspondence courses, because they're all at a different level. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Although I have to tell you, mm -hmm. my um, two-year-old, who was a very late talker for, mm -hmm. for various reasons, um, as we were working through the Prima Latina mm -hmm. Moria Press, he has memorized several of the prayers. Wonderful. He can, he can say, Mm. Despite not being able to say a lot of other things that are much more usual, he can say the last prayer. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. That's wonderful. <laughs> I, and I didn't anticipate a question like that, so I don't have a quick answer. Okay. But I'd like to think through it for a moment. And this has to do with um, what we're looking for uh, at the end, what your end goal is. Is your end goal living Latin, conversation, new Latin, neo-Latina? That could be one, right? Um, or is it simply to be able to read the written word? The dead language that is the key, the, the, the tool that you need to open up the literature of the ancient world. Number two, that, that second option, is the basic um, uh, pedagogy of philology for the last 200 years. Uh, th that is how I was trained. That's how my discipline continues to train, except for a couple of anomalies in the living Latin movement that uh, require oral and oral composition skill. And they're doing this at places like University of Kentucky and a couple of other smaller schools. And I think it's fantastic, and it is a, it poses an extreme challenge to me and I'm no dummy. I'm a pretty smart cookie, but I can't listen to a Latin conversation and just start following along. I would need some extra training with that. So if you've got students in one family that range in age from say 12 to 2 and you want to start them out all on the same challenge, I do it with Neo-Latin, I do it with spoken. I, and I think that what you're saying with Prima Latina is that they offer some of that, especially because at the, the low grammar stage, you're working with memorization, you're thinking about recitation. And if that gets into your head, you're gonna start thinking about things. Uh, uh, you're, you're gonna start making those connections back with those things that are memorized. And I would supplement that <laughs> with things that are salutary. 
Pull out a Vulgate and start doing it with the Psalms, for example. Memorize little by little, because there's plenty of scripture memorization. You don't go to the Roman Missal unless you happen to be a Roman Catholic, right? And even they don't do it anymore after Vatican II, but you can look at the uh, Latin of uh, the, the Catechism, the Latin of the, the uh, other books in our confessions, and you can look at the Psalms and, and other salutary portions of the scripture for memorization and, and uh, offer that for that wide range of ages. And that's more of a, a, a living Latin sort of thing. What I would write under number two here is what are your goals? What are your goals in, uh, in education? I would say to be able to speak and uh, have conversation is not the primary goal. The primary goal is to be able to, uh, number one, or A, uh, is get a good grammar for yourself. Get a, a, a syntax that helps with other languages. Grammar, in, in other words, i.e., how language works. This is what grammar school exists for. This is why we teach Latin grammar as a reflection of English grammar. And if your second to fourth grader uh, doesn't see the uh, reflection of uh, how nouns work, parts of speech, prepositional phrases, and that sort of thing by the time they're in fourth or fifth grade, then I think that your Latin language learning is probably doing you a disservice and is a waste of time, as opposed to giving you a structure for understanding human communication in the vernacular, the English that you're speaking at home or in school. Right? That's, that's one short-term goal. I think there's some other long-term goals that come out of this. For example, being able to read Virgil, being able to read Virgil or Ovid right, or Cicero. Uh, this should be the long-term goal, but you're not going to do that in second grade. You wouldn't uh, uh, give them an entire epic to schlog through in second grade in English translation either. right? You build on these things. And so uh, your short-term goal, the, the scaffold that you ought to be doing, number one, is uh, how language works. But I don't think that a long-term goal should be living language uh, uh, Neo-Latin. It's, it's not part of my training. I'm not saying there's anything bad about it. But if your long-term goals are those uh, uh, classics, then you can do more that gets some other fringe benefits along the way, such as just dealing with the elementary portions of how language works. Does that satisfy your, your question? Did I answer it? Yeah, I think so. I think I, the way it's going to end up being, mm -hmm. and just the way I, I think it works with all the subjects that I'm teaching to this multi group that mm -hmm. I have, is that the eldest gets a different approach to his education than the youngest, yeah. just because the youngest hears a lot of things. Uh -huh. They're going to be different kids, and they're going to be differently educated anyway. <laughs> The yeah, yeah, that's that's going to be tough. God bless you in doing it. Yeah. Uh, my name is Charles Henriksen. Did we go to the seminary together? I think we did. What's that? Didn't we go to seminary together, Charles? When did you graduate? 1990. Yeah. Well, I was a, you're an old guy then. Never mind. I was. But then I, but then I did. STM and PhD work there. Because I was there in 96 to 01. I think you were around. I was doing PhD work. Yeah, okay. We were probably hanging out in classes together sometime. Okay. Schreiber. So I teach the online yeah. Yeah. course here for, and I use Wheelock, yeah. and it's for adults. Uh -huh. And I do, for Latin 1, I do the first 20 chapters, and for Latin 2, I do the second 20 chapters. Okay. And Sounds like my college course, yeah. And the way they run this, because adults, have jobs and things, uh -huh. they can't do three classes a week. Yep. So we meet on alternate Mondays, yep. every other Monday for an hour for a live session. In that live session, I go over in half the hour, I go over the translations, the exercitationes, and the, mm -hmm. uh, the sententia and tiquai yep. from the previous chapter and entertain their question where they stumbled or something, mm -hmm. explain things. And then in the second half, I introduced the new chapter. Yeah. Now, what students want to know is how much time do they need yeah. in between the, every other week? And I, I've been saying probably three to four hours. And the way I reason is 
Mm -hmm. An hour basically to reread the chapter, an hour to do the exercises, and an uh, hour to drill vocab, paradigms, and principal parts. At least that much. Yeah. Are you talking about a day? No, I'm talking. No, not a day. <laughs> I'm talking about they got. In other words, they're not going to learn Latin just with one hour of live session every other week. That's right. They've got to put in some time on their own. Yeah. That's right, and I, I think that's absolutely appropriate. And teaching adults is different than teaching children yeah. with this. But I, I think that uh, the the time frame that you're offering for a self-motivated, independent adult who is uh, giving you a little bit of uh, remuneration for this as well. You're not doing this as a service to the church and society, yeah. right? Uh, uh, is probably motivated to do that. Do you? Ha how's your uh, retention? Uh, do you have a lot of attrition? Yes. Do people finish? Attrition. Okay. Uh, uh, are are you retaining 80%? Our, our students here. Sometimes mm -hmm. there are schedule changes. Yeah. Now, what we do with the live sessions, we also record it. Yeah. So some, if there's yeah, you can get it on YouTube now. Recording. Yeah, that's great. But inevitably, whether I'm teaching Greek or Latin, there is attrition over the year because it's probably more than they bargained for. Well, and it's the same uh, at the undergraduate stage, and it's not as easy to get attrition with sixth graders because mom's making them do it. <laughs> paying 250 bucks. Yeah. For the year. Yeah. So that, Hopefully well, and frankly, it's a bargain, right? At two, at two fifty, and I, I wish I got that for independent study. Anyway. Um, uh, if you're doing that over the course of the year, it's a very slow pace to yeah. do it. Um, I think that you can get through Wheelock with adults, depending on where, uh, if they've got the opportunity to do it, at a chapter a week. And you can do this for free independently online with communities that want to do this all the time. Well, uh, hey, that's fine, yeah. yeah. Are, uh, are you familiar with latinstudy.com and, and greekstudy.com? And I just, I teach. Greek from uh, Veltz, uh -huh. and I teach uh, Latin yeah. from Wheelock, and I've been yeah. doing this for and I, and I think that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's great if you can get an independent business uh, to, to do that. What's nice about Wheelock is that it opens up the opportunity for independent study, and for adults, it's great, because there's a plethora of uh, uh, resources online that are downloadable for free, and also that you can pay for. Um, the uh, 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 Wheelock is uh, good for independent study, because you can do it at your pace, and there's plenty of independent uh, uh, people doing it online already, so that you're not alone with it. Uh, you can pay a very nominal fee, and I think it's very reasonable, Charles, and thank you for uh, keeping it as low is that or you can pay nothing at all and then you're really on your own you're not working with live sessions with a, a pedagogue but it's a, a good outline for for getting through it but there are other books available I want to be able to talk about those two I first follow up Rick LaFleur uh -huh. who is the editor of yeah. all the We Like stuff nowadays yeah. has a Facebook group mm -hmm. called Latin in the real world mm -hmm. and I went on that and that would be of interest I think to anybody sure. here and sure. there's a website called WeLaxLatin.com. Sure. We don't have any association with it. So mm -hmm. Like I say, there's plenty of resources online, but there's resources uh, elsewhere too. And once you've gotten some Latin under your belt, you can use those uh, with any text. Uh, but to glom onto this, since we're thinking about curriculum, um, I don't use uh, Prima Latina uh, or Latina Christiana. I, and I, I have nothing against those books at all. It's just not part of uh, what my duties have required me to, to use so far, but there are, uh, 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 about a dozen that I have had to use, and uh, ultimately any book is okay, uh, really. Any book is okay because if you're getting a comprehensive Latin curriculum, by the end of it, where, whether it's chapter 10 or chapter 38 or wherever the book ends, you'll be able to do the things that uh, we do with this language. Okay? But be consistent. Pick one and, and finish it out. I just find these to be the easiest or the best for me, for my students of college age, adults, and for children. I think a wee lot can be used with children, um, but th this is nothing against Prima Latina or Latina Christiana. I don't want any of the vendors to get upset with me. These are just from my experience, the f the f my top five. I love Wheelock. 
I love OLC. That's the Oxford Latin course. Three books, orange, yellow, blue, graduated. We give it to seventh and eighth graders. OLC has a lot of cartoons that were uh, drawn by the daughter of the author, Maurice Balmy, and so they're hilarious because um, they, they were drawn in second grade. <laughs> and so it, it covers the lifespan of Quintus Horatius Flaccus, the uh, famous poet, friend of Mycenaeus and therefore of Augustus and colleague of Virgil. Um, Hans Erberg's uh, Lingua Latina, you like Erberg? No? You don't like Erberg? Or you do? See lots of interesting things in various things. Okay, no, you can do it, dance or whatever, that's cool. Okay, so uh, I love the lingua latina per se illustrata because it's got no English in it whatsoever and it's sort of like throwing a kid or throwing a professor or whoever into the deep end of the pool and say, swim! <laughs> wow, that's great. Yes, question. So my question for you, I'm Mary Murphy. Hi. I actually have a minor in Latin. Wonderful, from? Uh, University of Oklahoma. Wonderful. And I forgot it all. Yeah. <laughs> I can't the Latin, and it fills me with joy. Yes. But when I'm so impatient with my children, and they're not full of joy. Oh, yeah. I wonder if you find a Latin immersive book uh -huh. or a series. I mean, is that what would help me? Oh, maybe. Yeah, just me so that I get my Latin thing. Yeah, get, yeah, get some joy. I got so much joy out of this. There's laughter. I mean, it's not chuckles every minute, right? Um, but it's an awful lot of fun. It's, it just gets through the family life of a Roman family in the first century, and you're graduating from simple nouns and simple verbs to more complex sentences. It's beautiful. What are you doing? You're talking about the uh, this is the, the not this is the Erberg, the Hans Erberg, lingua Latina per se illustrata. Yeah, there's no English in it. <laughs> now there are supplements and helps for this um, that, that you can purchase, you know, teacher's edition. Hey, here's what we really mean by nouns and, and whatnot. But it's, it's all in Latin and you, you you have enough Latin with a Latin minor to dive into page one. And it says Italia est in Europa. Hey, did you know Italy is in Europe? Roma est in Italia. It's like, yes, Dick and Jane for Latin, yeah! Okay, and, but by the end, you got the pluperfect subjunctive, and it's okay. <laughs> The CLC, the Cambridge Latin course, also covers um, uh, a, 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 an ongoing story through its curriculum. It has a couple of different volumes and uh, graduates, uh, graduates through them. Uh, Oxford, Cambridge, of course, you'd expect them to have these courses, and they do. And there's plenty of schools that uh, just uh, keep them on hand. You know, they make your big book purchase and then do that for the next 20 years, and then uh, they, they get kind of crusty and old. But you know, you got to go with what you got. Ecke Romani, I taught in a Christian home educators co-op in uh, St. Louis while I was at seminary. Drove all the way to West County and back uh, to uh, do these, uh, do this for the students. I had fifth graders through seniors in high school, all at the same level, and uh, they all gave me a separate check every week for like seven dollars and eighty-one cents. It was weird, but uh, that's how they paid all their tutors. They had to do uh, the same thing for their calculus or their trig teachers and, and whatnot. And it was a great little co-op. It was called Check Christian Home Educators Co-op, and that's the first time I'd ever had Ecce Romani. But it was the same sort of OLC. CLC, Oxford or, or Cambridge kind of course with, with several books and a, and, a, and a narrative. But these are just my favorites. I'm not saying that you, you got to get them. I'm just saying that I think they're the easiest ones that I've seen to be able to use for independent study, for adults, for high schoolers, and for fourth graders and fifth graders. You use Wheelock for which levels at Faith? For, for six through 12? So you're getting through that in six years or seven or eight if they get held back. Okay, so uh, you get a lot of years to get through that, and that's great. It graduates little by little. It's definitely finished by a lot of students which is sophomore. Excellent. Okay, so you get three or four years to get through it, which is appropriate for Wheelock at the junior high or, or high school stage, so that, then you can get into readings. Yeah. yeah. What's your name? Lolly Taha. I don't know any Latin, and I would like to teach my first and second graders, mm -hmm. Latin, but I need to learn along with them. Yeah. So, 
What do you do? <laughs> you know, as I was talking with Rebecca, my wife, uh, about what I should even say here, uh, I had you in mind. I had you in mind. And it concludes this way. Don't just give people worksheets and expect that they're going to get this stuff. Don't just you know, say, OK, uh, this is something that we're doing. Now do the worksheet, and then we'll check it off. And now we've headhunted a language, and we're, now we're classical. Can't, you can't do it like that. So I have some prepared comments about that. I'm going to begin with a couple of them. I'm going to keep on coming back to you. And I might not be saying much that you don't know already, but understand how desperately sincere I am about this. OK, you trust me? All right. I titled this talk, Panic at the Disco Discorate Diddy Key, uh, partially because I knew nobody would get the joke, and partially because when I was asked to offer a talk on how to teach Latin, my assumption was that many would like to, but few have the confidence to begin, the fortitude to carry it through, or even the basic know-how to consider doing it for a year, <laughs> or two years, or more years. If you're going to do a curriculum that's classical, I think Latin is a sine qua non. You've got to get it done. I have so many students that say, oh, I've already done Latin. I don't need to do it with you, Armstrong. I say, oh, when did you do it? I said, well, I did it a month in fourth grade. He's like, oh, yeah, you did Latin. Way to go. I don't need to take Greek anymore. Why not? Well, my parents were experimenting with classical education, so I learned the Greek alphabet. I don't need Greek anymore. I did it. Headhunt. Yeah. It's like going to a museum and taking pictures of everything in an hour and saying, hey, let's go two hours for lunch and I never want to go to the Vatican again. No, no, that, that doesn't give you anything, right? It requires discipline. It requires a commitment. It requires an investment for, for your kids and for yourself, for yourself. Mm. I don't know that anything I say or do will actually quell any panic or anxiety you come with as a classical educator or a homeschooler or a school teacher or an administrator. Are there any administrators here besides Kieser? <laughs> All right, we're going to ask you to leave the room from time to time when we talk about them. All right, but I can tell you as a college professor and instructor of Latin to graduate students, undergrads, high school, elementary students for the last 21 years that the only thing that drives out fear is knowledge, sure and certain. And that works for tests, too, by the way. I've got students of plenty who claim test anxiety or quiz anxiety as a real thing requiring special accommodations. I'm all for accommodating special needs. I deal with them every day. But there's only one thing that can calm down test anxiety. And I tell this to my students. What do I say, Aubrey? No. Know everything. Yeah. If you know everything, you're going to do well on the test. Yeah, you don't have to worry about it anymore. And that's true in teaching, too, any subject. If you are deciding at this stage to bite off classical education because you've heard some news reports or you're part of a conservative ideology or you're in a community that wants to do it and say, oh, this might be a good idea, OK, you got to know some stuff. you got to read. And if you're reading stuff and it's hard to do and you don't like it, it might not be for you, and that's OK. Or maybe you just need to get some people around you to encourage you and inspire you to do this. Because I think this is great, and I think it's great for everybody. And I want everybody to have access to it, too. That's what is kind of difficult. And one of the major challenges in, in classical education in America is just accessibility to it. Uh, besides just the, the philosophical leap you got to make um, uh, in, in this culture. But it's true that you need to know this stuff. But it turns out that what one is usually doing, we end up teaching things that we're more familiar with, and we spend more time with it. So if you're sold on classical ed and a classical curriculum, and you haven't yourself been raised with the classics, then you've got an education of your own to catch up on before you teach others. And learning and prepping to the lesson plan, that is like learning alongside your student, this is difficult, I think, because uh, it's going through the motions. It's going through the forms. Uh, and you're doing it because somewhere someone said that this is a good idea to do. And it'll get you far, a certain distance, but it will really only get you so far because it's a quick way to suck the joy out of the job. It doesn't provide a space for the passion that is necessary truly to succeed in teaching. If you're teaching stuff, I want you to be in love with it because that's going to make your student love to learn. Don't get me wrong. You can be a passionless teacher. I've seen plenty of them. Look at Charles. He doesn't have any passion. <laughs> 
I've had a few passionless teachers in my day. I've, I've seen my share. And passion itself does not make somebody a good teacher. It might just make them goofy or weird, right? So, but you know what it is to sit at the feet of someone who is not only master of her craft, but is also flat out thrilled to be sharing what she's sharing with anyone who will listen? This is what makes a good teacher of anything. And that's the first point I want to point out, to underscore in a talk as generic of, as how to teach Latin. I'm not certain how to do it, really, beyond getting through the grammar essentials, the parts of speech, the phonemes, the morphemes, how to pronounce this stuff, right? And the tripod of vocab syntax and morphology before we do it in a graduated way in a comprehensive book that's going to get to the passive periphrastic and the gerund gerund of switcheroo and the six flavors of conditional sentence. Man, I love my later lectures. They're fun. I love language. I love how words work. Mm. I say, I'm not certain I know how to do it, but I'll tell you this, I love it. I love it. I love language, and I love that language in particular. And I've got enough alumni that have had this rub off on them that they've decided, hey, I think it would be a good idea to make half the money that I could and teach in classical school for the rest of my life. <laughs> Isn't that extraordinary? Why would anybody do that when they could be a plumber instead? When you need a plumber, you need a plumber. You're willing to just pay, 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 right? But they want, they're going to teach Latin? Blessed art thou. I, why would you do that? I'll tell you why. Because it's a lovely language and it's easy to fall in love with. Oh, baby. All right. I've got some anecdotes about that stuff. I'm going to just skip it. But I love it, and that's my primary point. You've got to love it. If you don't, don't try to get there on your own. If you don't love it, or you don't love it yet, don't try to get there on your own, all right? Work with someone who does love it. You ever go to the gym with someone uh, uh, who doesn't want to be at the gym, right? Uh, it's, hey, let's just get chili fries or something like that. No, uh, you gotta you gotta be there with somebody who's motivated. That's your personal coach, right? He's like, yeah, we're gonna do lunges. No, see, I need that. If I'm ever gonna do a lunge in my life, I need to be inspired to do it. You need to work with someone. Same with Latin, any leg of the classical curriculum. You need to walk along someone who loves this material. And it's probably the same with math, right? Sciences, humanities, rhetoric, logic, etc. You need to walk alongside with somebody. And you've got to love your audience. And I've got no doubt you love your audience. It's easy to love your kids. Until, are they teenagers? Well, I've got some of those too. Okay, it's easy to love some of your kids, right? I'm not dissing teenagers. I love them. I was one once too. I just, oh, I got 20 to 14 right now. Remember when they were three? Oh, my favorite age. Now it's just a bigger challenge, right? You gotta love your kids to do this stuff. Uh, love the material and love the student. That's, that's number one. Okay. So, uh, more on that to come, but that, that's what I'd want to say first. There were two things that came out of that. Number one, I'm into love, 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 love. Okay, that's good. Number two, it might do you worth, it might be worthwhile to give yourself the semester really to dig in with a personal trainer. You know, like a, like a Charles, or with uh, somebody for free online, or with the curriculum that you say, I'm going to do independent study and check in with somebody who cares about classical ed. I'm the point person at Irvine for classical ed right now, all right? Or uh, it's, it's Korchok here at Chicago, all right? It's Mobley and Manoj and, and uh, a whole staff at, at, at Mequon. Why? It's not because we're trying to get your students. I promise you that. That's what the foundation office is for and admissions and whatnot. I just like doing Latin. So he got questions. I got answers, right? uh, and, and that's why I offer the email. But you have other people local to you, other people close to you. Remind me where you're from. Rich. See, Southern California. I think it was meant to be. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there and say love, but get to know it first. Right? You had a question. Go. Yeah, um, as a homeschool, former homeschooler who went through a Hillsdale Classics program. You I formerly homeschooled people? I was formerly homeschooled. Oh, you didn't have children? No, nope, not yet. Okay, uh, go ahead. Anyway, the, I, I get a lot of people asking me, people who do homeschool yeah. and want to teach Latin yeah. or Greek, asking like, okay, how do I do this? Same kinds of things people are asking mm -hmm. you. 
And one of the things that consistently comes up is I want to teach Latin, but the grammatical terminology that's used is a foreign language to me in itself. Yeah. Because a lot of people weren't taught English using phrases that's like right. nominative and accusative. Yeah, that's right. Do you know of many good resources out there for teaching the grammatical terminology behind it? <laughs> yeah, and it comes with a, a 101 text. I, and I think that any of these texts would be good for that. Probably with the exception of the Erberg text, because he gives you those t uh, those terms. They just happen to be in Latin, so that's like two degrees removed from easy at that point. Huh? What's a nomen? I thought a nomen was a name. Oh, it turns out it's a noun too. Verbum. I thought that was a word. No, that's also a verb. Right. So you got to uh, uh, be careful with that one. But Wheelock has a great explanation of inflection in general. Um, and, and that is, is something also, we've got so much data out there, so much information. You say, wow, it's an inflected language? I wonder what Wikipedia says about that. And it turns out there's a lot out there just for free for the motivated uh, pedagogue or for the, the motivated student to learn about that stuff. But some of this is just the investment in discipline. Like I said, I can't give you a pill or, or a shot or you know something inspirational that says, I, I know Latin after 45 minutes. No, 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 I know how to teach Latin after 45 minutes. No, it requires some discipline. And while your adult students get four to five hours between lesson one and lesson two, uh, I'm looking at that and saying, hey, if you really want to uh, get through it quick, that's four to five hours over the course of two days for my undergrads, two hours a night. And it's divided up just like any the best, hmm, the best analogy for this is music. Who has piano lessons, trumpet lessons, flute lessons, uh, vocal lessons? Your, your mom made you practice, right? In front of a stand and a, and a uh, what do you call that? It goes click, click, click. A metronome. Uh, metronome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Greek words, metronome. It measures the gnome. Okay. So you, you tap, tap, tap. And what do you, you how long do you got to practice? Remember how long you had to practice? How, how long did you have to practice piano? Yeah, every day, and your mom said you're not getting dinner unless you do that, right? Yeah, that's right. And if you do that for 30 days, and it turns out that's just part of your life, same thing with a language. You got to start out with your scales, and then you do your arpeggios, and then you do your etude, right? And then you do uh, cream or something like that. I don't know, you get to do the fun stuff after that. But by the time you're done with that, that's an hour, two hours. Same thing with the language. It takes that much time. If you really want to master it. Oh, I know that. Yeah. I put in like three to four hours a night for a year and a half. Yeah. We know that. We know how it requires discipline. So it's a daunting task. Here's another way to do it. Shove it off on somebody else and pay them, right? There's Latin tutors, just like there's calculus tutors, right? When your junior higher needs to do trig, because she's you know, prodigious and she likes triangles and she's got to that point. Is mom doing trig at that point? Maybe, maybe not, right? So you hire out. But what I really wanna encourage is just what you said at first. Learn with the kids, mm -hmm, but learn some before you do that. And uh, you can be a homeschooler and teach Latin. You can do this. You don't have to dish it off on somebody for 10 bucks an hour or $30 an hour or however much of the market rate is these days. Please. Uh, so I, I actually do want to recommend Reverend Hutchinson's uh, class. Because I, Did you do this? I took Latin one. Yeah, good. Uh, I still have all the recordings, which is nice because then you can go into more pace. That's great. Like, uh, obviously, your life. Um, moves at different paces yeah. at different times. Yeah. And so that was very helpful to have a recording of somebody teaching it that I can get to at my own pace. And then it takes me as long to get through the vocab each, each mm -hmm. time until the next time. Mm -hmm. I, 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 didn't, I never got to it live. Um, and so, because the whole point is to, to master rather than just to get through. Yeah. That's, that's why we homeschool. Like yeah. class of education, because you're, you're getting to a point rather than just trying to shove them through. That's right. Um, and uh, and my understanding too is Prima Latina is intended to learn alongside your children. That's great. Your children. That's great. They, they teach it to you so that you can turn around and teach it to them. I want to go one further on this and encourage you uh, with the, uh, it, these things take as long as we give them sometimes. And if we have that attitude, then it's actually never going to get done. You won't get mastery. Uh, Rebecca, my wife, is over here. And I want you to congratulate her. She's over 1,000 days on Duolingo for German now. Yes, yes. 
Yes. Yeah. And but why am I saying that? Because you can't talk to anybody in German right now. You know, it's like I, I, a thousand days in German, three years of work. I still don't know the language, right? And I, I, this is not a diss on Duolingo. I love Duolingo uh, until it broke my streak, and you know, because I was traveling and it didn't count my midnight as midnight in the Pacific time zone, and so I got tired of doing my Italian, and then I said, no more, man, no more Duolingo. But I'll tell you, as an educator, I know this. If I want to learn Italian, I'm going to go to the community college. And I'm going to enroll in an evening class where there's quizzes and tests because that's how I learn. And if I don't have that, it's going to take as long as it takes. So it might be more of an investment. Man, it, uh, nothing against our, our good brother, uh, uh, Pastor Henderson. I, and I want you to, uh, in, uh, I want to encourage that. Uh, uh, Hendrickson, sorry. But um, uh, if you want the pressure, if you're the kind of person like me that requires the, the pressure to learn under a, a magistra, under a, under a teacher, okay, uh, you can go to the local college or university near you. If you live in an area with a college or university, like the University of Dallas, for example, and really get this stuff down. And that's another option for you. But it's an investment. It's an investment, and you treat it as such. Okay, yes, please. What's your name? Uh, Mark Bucks at uh, homeschooled Wonderful. children through high school, and my wife did the Latin when we were homeschooling. Wonderful. And then um, when we took a call to a classical school, I have no Latin background, and I was thrown in to teach Latin. Oh! Which I completely understand how you feel, but the thing is, they didn't know Latin either. So, by starting very basic, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, and my, I had access to my son's Wheelock book from college. There you go. Yeah. So I could on my own because I've already had Greek and Hebrew. Good. You know, it Stay a chapter ahead. Yeah. You know. You can do it. More, you know. So mm -hmm. You can do that because like, a lot of times teachers don't have a choice. That's right. Great to say, well, you know, I don't want to do that. But, yeah. So. My initial comments were geared or were thought out with the uh, consideration that if you don't have Latin, you don't have any language. Right. And of course, with theological training in a conservative church body like the LCMS, it still requires Greek and Hebrew. You had uh, a, a good sense of having to step into a foreign language for the specific express purpose of decoding a dead language, something written down, not having conversations. So my wife did it first. Yeah. yeah, and that helps. I know, yeah, and so the program was simple enough. That didn't work. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Please. Uh, I'm like you, I need the pressure of a deadline uh -huh. to, for an exam or something yeah. to, to really get to it. Are there, um, for some languages there are, proficiency tests and yeah. things like this. Is, is there some sort of concrete goal like that that I could? Ultimately, the concrete goal and the proficiency test that I give to students is essentially a reading exam for some of the classical authors of ancient Latin. And so I'll pull out 20 lines of Virgil for the student that says, I don't need to take Latin 101. I'll say, oh, really? Uh, let's just take the uh, Virgil passage, and you're going to do something from book 10 of the Aeneid. And uh, based on that, if they can get about 75 to 80% accuracy, you know, I'll put them in a Latin 301 class instead or, or, or something higher. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. It's like a reading exam in graduate school if you've done comprehensives at, for at the master's level or the PhD level. Uh, it's, it's just a reading exam. Yeah. Um, there are others that other nations offer, and the Anglophone nations are the easiest. In England, it's the GCSE. And I forget what the GCSE stands for, but it tells you whether you're going to be at your A level or your B level or your C level for language. And those are published items, but what's the, the content of them is simply this. It's uh, the, the classics. They, they'll give you passages of these classic texts and, and have you uh, do them. 3,000 students last year took the AP Latin exam, and that's exactly what it is. They give you six authors, study these, study these, these works, and uh, if you do it at a certain level, you get a five, four, three, or, or not pass for that uh, AP exam, like other AP exams in like Spanish literature is the same sort of thing. 
Uh, there's also national Latin exams, and you're f well familiar with those if you have been a part of the uh, 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 CCLE for a while, because that uh, works with little kids, you know, all the way up to big kids for ribbons and awards, and congratulations for those of you who won awards on the national Latin exam. It's great. Please. And, and if your idea is to get to a level of proficiency where you could pass a test like he's talking about, mm -hmm. it, having fair expectations is good. I mean, spending a year and a half in Wheelock is not going to get you to the point where you can uh, pick up a book of Virgil and right. it. I spent a year and a half on Greek. It still took me another couple of years before I could actually pick up a Greek text and muddle through it without looking through the dictionary for every other line. So what should a good homeschool education then look like with regard specifically to the teaching of language? Let's talk Latin, but you can do this with Greek too. What should a good classical school look like from soup to nuts, right? From the beginning to the end, if uh, specifically with regard to Latin? And uh, for that matter, a, a major curriculum at a university like the one that I teach at, which does not offer a major, I get to teach Latin because it's a love of my life. And I do this as labor of love. Uh, New Testament and Old Testament and core history pays the bills, but I get to do Latin on my own right? because I love it. But if I were at a university that had a, a major curriculum, it, I'd be asking the same kinds of questions. It needs to instill the discipline of doing this daily and say that this is just what we do because it's as normal as anything to do. It's not flash in the pan, we're going to try it and then lay off for or, or two years is enough. I think it needs to be part of an integrated curriculum through the course of your student's life. And if you do that, you're going to offer the kind of discipline necessary to do it. So that as a minor in Latin, you don't forget it because you took the equivalent of about two years worth of upper division work and then didn't see it for a while. I did the same thing with math. I was a math major for a good long time. And then I had a good colleague at Concordia University a few years ago. He said, you know what I haven't done in a while? Calculus. I said, yeah, you're right. Let's do it again. And so that year, we taught each other calculus again. You need friends like that. Well, thankfully, the love of grammar continues. Yes. Yes. You want your students to be able to write well? Teach them Latin. You want your students to be able to read well, more critically, teach them Latin. Because that is the abstract goal, is to organize the mind. And here, we're not being biologically or physiologically realists. I don't know that the map of the brain actually changes. Maybe it does. But uh, what I'm talking about is the file cabinets, right? To, to put the hang files and then the manila folders and then the other kinds of stuff in there. It organizes the mind that way. The Italians require Latin. Uh, it's compulsory for all gymnasium students, uh, Latin and Greek, for the five years that they're in the, what the, is their equivalent of high school. And they continue to say, hey, don't, th this opens their mind. It opens the mind. And the students of, at that high school age, they're doing three to four hours of homework every night just translating texts from Greek and Latin in their junior and senior years equivalent. And there's a lot of criticism about that. And, but, you know, hey, you know, there's more practical things to do. Yeah, there are. There are. Um, they say they claim it opens their mind. Yeah. Uh, can you can you measure that? Yes, you can. Right. By looking at writing, by looking at reading. As, as when I think about organizing the mind, there is the the major goal for uh, uh, me as a as a university professor in a, a college that does not require language in many majors at all. Like, why would I do that? Because it makes you a, a better student. It made Aubrey a better student. She probably wouldn't have even graduated had it not been for my classes, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. That, that's, that's probably an exaggeration. Please? Are you saying I got five minutes? For reals, five minutes? You're telling me to wrap it up? OK, hang on a second. I hit a lot of the points that I wanted to hit, including this one, the fringe benefit of keeping the grammar goal at the center of grammar, learning the grammar, right? before you think that the, uh, this is the short-term goal. This is not the short-term goal. This is the long-term goal. Fringe benefit of keeping the grammar goal at the center of grammar teaching while students are in grammar school is that it organizes the mind. 
Uh, and then I said, let's talk curriculum. Uh, here are my faves. You don't have to choose one of these, but whatever you do, whatever you do, use it and don't veer from it. Same with pronunciation. Go classical with hard K sounds or go ecclesiastical with the chuz and the tzs, but do it consistently, whatever you do. Uh, one sad thing that I saw with this, I, I know a self-starter who self-started new curricula in Latin for her homeschool group of four families five families maybe, and she self-started that new curriculum, uh, a new curriculum in Latin um, uh, three years in a row. Did a different Latin curriculum three years in a row, and they could, it was like they were spinning their wheels. They couldn't get away from chapter one, two, and three. Different pronunciations, different vocabulary, different uh, initial things. The kids got something, and they're not getting it anymore. They decided just to ditch it. That's, that's a failure on, on some level. Uh, it's not, they, they, they got something, but they, here's what they didn't get. They didn't get a consistent and disciplined approach. Um, any curriculum that breaks down stuff little by little for memorization for young children, I'm all for it, like, like Prima Latina. Um, but you need to find something that builds your vocabulary and memorizes sentences. Uh, and you can help by building their vocabulary in other ways too. Prayers, verses, it's all good. When you get to middle school, uh, f uh, fifth grade, sixth grade, I think these are the, these are the things to uh, work with, all right? Uh, as, as far as just my, my faves. Let's see. I wanted to make certain I did that. I talked about love, love, love. You got and I want you to do it with your kids. You can't just give them a lecture or, or a worksheet, right? You know how to get kids to get interested in art? Here, you could give them a lecture, a PowerPoint slide on the nature of pottery, and and say, there's this is a pot. This is how you spell it, and here's how you make it. You get the clay, and you get the fire, and or you could do this. Uh, get a get somebody who really knows how to throw clay and get her down on a wheel with all the clay and all the water and don't say anything just let the kids watch just let the kids watch that potter as she you know, molds and gets the water and kind of does this and all of a sudden you're thinking of Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore and it's like oh my love that's what you want right remember that movie what was it Ghost, yeah, yeah. Now your kid wants to be a potter when she grows up, right? That's cool, or watch that movie, I don't know. But that's how to teach, right? You, you gotta do it with your kids. You gotta be inspiring. You gotta be the one who gives them the love of learning. So I come back to my original thesis, love, 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 love. Please. When I took Latin here. Yeah, uh, at Chicago? At this school. You're an alumnus of this institution? Yes. Was it in this room? It was upstairs in Kretzmann. <laughs> uh, Who was your prof? Professor Freilich, of blessed memory. Yeah. Oh, Amen. I know that person's name. I have name. them for Latin and then yeah. I have them for Greek. Yeah. And whether, which you, whichever language, every class we would start out, we'd all say, Pater Noster, Quies in Capitals. Oh, he's in Yeah, he did a prayer. And then same thing with Greek. And I was thinking with your topic about. Uh huh the different ages, start every day reciting the Lord's Prayer in Latin. Sure, sure. Nordling at the, at the Fort Wayne Seminary does uh, contemporary Christian music. He doesn't do contemporary Christian music. He does camp songs in Greek, right? He does rejoice in the Lord all And he does it in Greek. You can evolve hearing, speaking, yeah. writing, reading. It helps. So yeah. the, Anybody here have Nordling for Greek, my friend John Nordling? No? That's, he's worthwhile. Go. Well, I actually know of a free family devotional book that's in multiple languages, including Latin. Get out of Dodge City. I didn't know that. Just go to LutheranHomeschool.com, and you'll see it. You can download it for free. Has this passed doctrinal review? <laughs> hey, all right. That's cool. Use it. Let's find out. <laughs> I want to share two more things because they're very encouraging. So it's never too late to learn Latin. My father-in-law... His father passed away, mm -hmm. and it's very sad, but he's been a caregiver, and so now he's borrowed my old wee lock, ah. and now he's finally going to work. Oh, I love it. And my sister is a Latin teacher down in Australia, Joanna Hunsley. Yeah. I, her husband used to be my next-door neighbor at Concordia University. Lovely. Yeah. Well, she has just started a Latin yeah. club yeah. at her church. 
And the kids love it. Wonderful. Because they don't know not to love it. That's right. They love it. They love it. Yeah. And there's a, there is a lot to love. Please. It, and uh, on top of that, you talked about learning for life. Yeah. Like the catechism. Amen. Which is available in Latin. Amen. Oh, not just in the triglata. <laughs> right. Should, but, uh, but there, uh, Edward Nauman, who's a uh -huh. pastor, Missouri Synod pastor, who's now a, he's a missionary. Uh, he did put out a uh, small catechism completely in Latin. Good. Uh, With which student is, notes. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. seven seven fifty. Seven dollars fifty cents. Oh, that's a bargain at any price. Yeah. yeah. You know, last year I did a talk. Uh, they, they asked me, hey, you want to do a talk? I said, sure. I said, well, what do they like? I, they said, I don't know. I said, well, I'm doing stuff on Ovid right now. You want me to just do a reading of Ovid? And uh, they said, sure. And I had a, I, we were all packed into your classroom. We were down in, in Plano, right, last year for the CCLE conference. And um, by, I guess I shouldn't have done that because I, not everybody could follow along. I was like, okay, well, I, I know a bunch of people know Latin. So I, I really appreciate your candor with me on this one. Again, getting to know my classical ed folks, my constituency. I care about uh, you, and I care about educating you, not just the little ones, but the big ones too, because that's our uh, service to church and society. It's something that we're uh, laying out for the next generation. Uh, I am so enthused by your uh, uh, desire to do this for uh, your families and for your schools, for the, the kids that don't necessarily belong to you biologically, but those are your students. And those, uh, look at these two kids here, you know. They're Aubrey's students. Aubrey was my student. That means they're my grands. They're my grand students. <laughs> That's pedigree right there. You're my grand students. That means that uh, you probably like me more than you like her, because that's how it goes with grandparents and grandkids, right? No, I think that's a beautiful thing, and I want you to have grand students too, right? You're going to have grand students too. And if I could have that kind of heritage, when I look back at heaven and think, wow, look at all these ones. I have lost none that you have given me. Yeah. All right, before I get more of a Messiah complex, I want to thank you for your time. And I'm available for some questions uh, for about five minutes or so before I go and see Getty Lee. All right, thank you.